Collective is a group of like-minded people from all around the world at different stages of their guitar building journey. You can join us over on our forum to seek advice or share tips on guitar building processes, materials and tools, or just to share your builds. On YouTube, we have a regular podcast of Guitar Building Chat, where you can join the live stream or watch back on past episodes. Our Instagram page shares posts of members' builds and links you direct to their accounts. And for those of you on Facebook, we've got a private group that you can join, share and chat along with. The Guitar Builders Collective is a welcome and open space for all, so do pop by and say hi. Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Great. So we've got um, Mark here from Hilditch Guitars, who we'll talk to in a moment. Uh, and then there's Scott and myself uh, as normal. And then we've got the live stream with, I can see some people here. Um, I, I, from what I can tell, for the next few weeks at least, we're just going to be stuck, stuck continuing doing it at this time because it works for me and Scott and Aaron can't really be around for a while. But there'll be some times nearer Christmas or December where he'll be able to join us at this time as well. Um, yeah, and hopefully he'll be here when we can talk about the Great Guitar Build-Off when all the entries are in and live because there's only a couple of weeks left. We thought that we'd talk about this Great Guitar Build-Off as always at the end though, so we can talk to Mark a bit more to start with. And I'm sure that people have got a lot to say after this week. I don't know if you saw, Scott, it seemed to be all Mark, it, in the Great Guitar Build-Off page on facebook it's just all kicking off lots of people um sort of talking about what's been happening and very worried and or very excited for new things it's quite interesting mm. i haven't been watching facebook all that close i, I should spend some time there though yeah uh, well it's it's the first time it's been interestingly different because normally facebook is just quite similar to seeing instagram feeds maybe yeah. just a little bit more chat but anyway, we'll talk about that later. We've got Mark here. Mark, um, I was just chatting to him a minute ago. He was part of the Guitar Builders Collective, which is how he found out about today. But I met you a couple of weekends ago now at the London Guitar Show. It did, yeah. Uh, I can't remember the date. It was back end of October, weren't it? Yeah. Yeah, oh, it's gone quick, the time since. Are you telling me? can't believe it's nearly Christmas again already. <laughs> <laughs> um i definitely want to ask you about shows because again we, we were just talking off camera about them because I, I find it really interesting i know that a lot of the people watching live in their countries there don't seem to be many shows or the shows are spread out or they're very expensive especially for a builder right. to participate in but we're we could a long ways away so what was that sorry scott or they're a long ways away oh yeah of course in this country nothing's that far away really there was uh there was one in dallas not too long ago that i i had thought about going to and i totally forgot but it would have been a five-hour drive oh hey, what what gee uh no i've not i've not quite done that far i think it was about three and a half for me to get to london uh, that's enough it's an hour. <laughs> right. I know, yeah well, you do that and then you got to stand all day like talking to people about guitars and then pack up and drive home again <laughs> Yeah. Sounds like fun though. <laughs> yeah, I've heard the thing to do is find where everyone's staying and go the night before and just get very drunk and hang out. Yeah. <laughs> that means socializing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not used to that. There's the joys of being a guitar builder. You're locked away. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. I, I, I'm on my own in my uh, little workshop all day. <laughs> so, so, what I thought, Mark, is we could find out a bit about. Um, how you got into guitar building stuff but it might be good for anyone in the chat to put questions in as well because this might be a good test if, if you've not seen mark's guitars before i'm sure we're going to have other guests on that we haven't seen before or met before so it'd be good to have maybe i think some questions that are quite common that everyone wants to ask but anyway how did you get into guitar building how long have you been doing it so yeah, it's, a, it's a, a tale it's a tall tale that one so I actually made my first one uh, in school for GCSE. Um, how old was I? 15, something like that. Um, yeah, but went through a crazy, crazy stage. As all kids do, they want something wild. And my favourite guitar at the time was a, a Warlock. BC Rich Warlock. Yeah. I saw that little smirk there, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I came up with this crazy shit. My mum couldn't convince my mum to buy me one. Um, and I had uh, some old crappy black strap copy thing. Uh, and it fell apart, basically. So I was like, oh, okay, here we go. So I came up with the idea that I was like, I could make myself one for a school project and thus dupe my mum into paying for all these expensive parts because mum, it's for school. <laughs> it's my education. Yeah, yeah. And it works. It's, no, it's, I should have brought it up really. It's downstairs. It's 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 crap. But anyway, but it but it works all right and it and it still works now. So that was the first one, mate. And then um I kinda I kinda came away from guitars and, and sort of live music for a while when I got my uh, license and discovered cars. Uh, that that was, became a petrol head for years. Uh I had a family young and whatnot, and then it was uh, when was it now? Maybe about eight years or so ago that I uh, when got my old guitars back out of the loft for whatever reason and started playing it. Um, and then just got back into music from there. So I had to go making another one um, just when I was off over Christmas break. Um, it was also terrible, but, you know, slightly less terrible than the previous one. <laughs> um but it, yeah, it was made out of Sapili and it was massive and it was like carrying a table around. <laughs> so, you know, that's, <laughs> yeah, it, is, it just kind of got shelved. And then when I started doing it properly then, so I did a, a few little bits, um, you know, little, little switch replacements, electrical replacements, things like that for people on, on the side. And then I got into it properly uh, about four years ago. I got a new job making furniture, uh, quite high-end stuff. And that was a massive change because I was selling bathrooms before that. But I've always had this sort of under undercurrent of, of being interested in woodworking, like from being a kid and putting things together, always playing with Lego and Meccano and things like that. So I've always had that sort of hands on. <clears throat> so I just woke up one day, I was like, mm, I fancy, you know, ch career change, go do something with wood. So got a job in this furniture place somehow. Um, Started on the machines initially and then moved up onto the benches. So whilst I was there, I thought, I'll have a go at making guitars properly, though. You know, you, you I, do, I had all sort of uh, these clever uh, blokes there that, you know, I could pick their brains off for the sort of fine woodworking aspect. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, it was good. They're actually woodworkers, not necessarily guitar builders. Exactly, yeah. So, you because you, obviously the, the furniture that they were making, it's it was high-end bespoke stuff literally for rich and famous people this is a story i always like to tell people this one the last job i did there because it was it was when covid happened we went off on furlough <clears> and i got a new job uh, and never went back to it but the last job i did was actually making furniture for wayne rooney's kids playroom oh wow well. <laughs> yeah like, that's that was that it's was the last job I did. Wayne Rooney. yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's a famous footballer soccer player yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah so and that you know that's the kind of clients that they had because they, they they got into all these um you know the interior designers that, that do all the same sort of in the same clicks as it were so but yeah it was good to pick the brains of of the bench joiner guys that were really good at the fine furniture and that sort of the fine woodworking and, and then sort of marry that up with my knowledge of guitars you know bring them both together and then you just start experimenting having fun it was nice having all the industrial scale equipment there as well so were you, you know, using like, some of that equipment then yeah well yeah so you're allowed to use as long as it was obviously when you clocked off stay behind in your own time and uh, and you're welcome to use it so that chessboard one there actually that was that was one of the first i think that was number two i've stamped that up you know serial number two and it was one of the lads in the machine shop said, why don't you do a chessboard? I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. So it's all solid, that. I've actually uh, have brought some up, look, prepared. Oh, yeah, yeah. excellent. Yeah, I wasn't sure, so I thought I'd bet just drop something on the screen. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, so it's all solid, like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was nice to have the, in, the industrial scale equipment um, that the guys were using there. I think the thing I miss the most actually is uh, the thickness sander. It was right. huge. You could get a set of gates through it. It was that big, but it could go down to like 0.1 of a mil. 
I'm just being nosy on your Instagram. So is this your home setup that you have or your, your workshop? Not at the. It is, yeah. It's my new one. So I've been working out of a drafty, damp, horrible concrete prefab garage in my garden for a few years. And then um, I got the opportunity to get this. It's a proper log cabin. Um, and it, I got it for nothing, actually. Uh, it was a, a mate of mine who's also a customer and he retired last year. And um, i have done some work for him when he picked his guitar while we were talking about my horrible concrete dingy shed that I was working in. And he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm retiring and I'll have this up for available very soon if you want it. I was like, right, sounds good. How much? No, he says you can have it. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So right, and I'll just find somewhere to put it because <laughs> it's uh, it's too big for my garden. So uh, it's gone in my mum's garden, actually. <laughs> ah, and I assume that's semi-local to you, so you don't have too far. It, it is. Yeah, it's literally two minutes away. <laughs> oh, so I know. Yeah, yeah. Nice easy drive. Yeah. So uh, yeah. And so, so that, that means that, the transition that, to mainly hand working. Because uh, like, when well, you talk about machines, you weren't talking about CNC then. You were talking about. I don't talk about CNC. No, yeah. I mean like plain earth thicknesser. Right. Um, yeah. Um, things like that, which was all just a big industrial scale. Because obviously you, you can get your stuff now, your little bench top versions, you know. And it, it was a bit of a shock, really, for me because I come <clears> from like you know, twenty, thirty grand machines down to a few hundred quid all in one job that i had to use i was like oh god <laughs> and you, you see obviously a massive difference in quality of of what comes out the other end of the machine basically and then you have to you know learn to deal with those other things um well yeah you know well you know you, you just get by don't you nothing nothing a bit of uh i'm playing can't sort out <laughs> i didn't have the advantage of starting with that kind of equipment but i know when i started off uh, super cheap equipment kind of drove how things got done. Mm -hmm. Yes, <clears throat> I had a tiny bandsaw that couldn't cut a, a whole neck blank, so I had to I cut my stripes and then did my laminates that way, and made necks that way for a little while. But uh, it wasn't the best situation. <clears throat> but I think you know when you have to deal with with um, you know low end or. Uh, limited equipment it kind of it kind of helps you come up a little better a little um a little more solid well-rounded you know yeah yeah you, you sort of find a workaround don't you yeah yeah it's yeah, funny you know, we, always, we were talking about using cheap tools and upgrading to better tools but none of us i i don't think any of us have started with 30 grand tools yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah no, it, was, it was a it was a bit of a shot really <laughs> When, when I shopped around, I spent, I spent about 300 quid on, you know, on a bench top playing a thickness there, and I was like, what, what is this? Why is it not doing what the other one did? Mm. What's going on? <laughs> How do people work like that? <laughs> but yeah, like I say, you've you just got to adapt and overcome, haven't you? But, you know, it does sort of, uh, I don't know, it probably helps develop your skills a bit more, really, because then you've got to, you, you've got to manually overcome that. Like I said, I, I ended up, it, the one I had sniped horrendously, no matter what I did, nothing I ever did would change it. And it was the way the rollers moved as the as the timber went in. And it was the same amount. You, you could get a piece, you, you could almost draw it. You'd have the same sort of, the, the starts would be flat, and then it would just go straight up and then banana down into the middle. So you had this sort of shape that, that, that was sniping at both ends. But, you know, you, you could take it out with a... With a a number five or a number six plane you know you're just playing it out and, and get it flat and that's what i had to do but with this this new space my workshop i've got more room and i've upgraded again now to a, a cast iron plane of thickness um not quite as fancy as as my other one but you know <laughs> it, it helps it's a lot better um yeah, that that is one piece of equipment that is nice to have. I mean, technically it's not an essential for guitar building, but it kind of is. It sure is nice to have. Yeah, it, it just makes it easier, it speeds it up, doesn't it? So you, 
you can just sort of set a few um, bodies or neck laminates bits, and you can just machine a run of guitar parts, as it were, at once because you know you just you're getting the the sort of uh, accurate, consistent results mm. from the machine, so you know that you can put three or four through and, and not worry too much. Yeah. You know, and it's all going to be the same sort of finish. Yeah, I definitely think when you're limited to time or you just want to build a lot, the tools that speed up the process that you know are consistently good are really worth investing in. Yeah, yeah. Definitely when I had limited time in my old my old tiny workshop, I spent so much of my time, because I could only have one sort of bench top thing out at once, moving it round yeah. and setting up, and it was yeah. just so time consuming. So moving to a larger workshop changed for me what I yeah, could yeah. do. I could just have everything lined up to move across. Exactly. Exactly. I was the same. I had a, a little router table, you know, this big, which way, that way, about that this big, under the bench, um, bench top bandsaw. And like you say, you've got these things that, and you have to pack it in in a certain way. And then you've got to move everything to get the, the, the tool that you want to use. And then it's got yeah. to go back under. But now I've got, you know, a big, big router table, just set up in the corner uh, with enough room to get a neck through. Uh, I can even, you know, it's in the corner, but I can even get a, like a through neck and, and route that if I need, because that, that's how I do my, you know, use my templates. Floor standing bandsaw now, upgraded that with a, with a 200 mil throat. Um, yeah, and, and I've got room. <clears throat> I put my bench, I kept my bench, that's probably the only thing I kept. Uh, put it in the middle, but extended it to take my table saw on the end as well. So then the bench is, is a full runoff for anything I put through the table saw. And then I put a mitre, mitre saw station in that that flips. So you just turn it over, the mitre saw is fixed underneath. So I've got a flat bench and then flip it over, the mitre saw is there. And obviously it's set level with the bench top then. So it, it the, the the base is all level across. So you just cut what I need, flip the saw away. Um, yeah, and it's great just having that that sort of freedom to have everything out, and you can just move around in, in a process and and follow the steps, and not have to, you know, mess around getting things out, putting it away, whatnot. It's all there. Just keep the floor tidy. I love seeing videos of people with workshops that flip and change like that, and, and yeah. uh, where the tools just appear when you need them, then disappear. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool. It's good. It's good. The only problem is I find myself not using the mitre saw because I've got everything out. I'm just like I don't want to put. If I'm working on the bench, I'm like, I could just do with making a nice square cut. They say, you know, it's like a 10 second cut. And it's like, hmm. In the yeah. process I'm doing, I've got to pack it all the way. Yeah, okay, it's a bit of a bother. I'll just use the bandsaw in there, sand it. <laughs> but, you know, if I've got a, a run of things, a, a load of stuff that I want to cut, then, you know, it's it makes sense to, to get it, you know, flip it out. Yeah, it's, mm, I have a similar. Uh, I, you know, my part is laziness. Um, I inherited a, a fair number of tools from my dad, and one of them is a, a, a radial arm. Uh, that's in earlier videos I used a lot, but uh, in the move, <clears throat> it got a little dinged up, and I need to get things set up, and it's just, ah, uh, it's work, and I, it just sits there collecting shit now. So, you know, yeah, I use the bandsaw for whatever, and yeah. yeah. Um, I really need to get that thing set up though. But uh, a ready alarm, uh, his baby was a $10,000 uh, table saw and uh, and the drill press, the pillar drill, uh, were three big, nice things that I inherited from him. So otherwise, I, I wouldn't have much in the way of tools. I bought me a decent bandsaw, a 14 inch. Um, I can't live without that thing. <laughs> yeah, too too useful, aren't they? Bandsaws. You can, there isn't a lot that you can't do on one, is there? Yeah. I remember when I bought mine. It was it's a relatively cheap one. It's by a company called Record Power. So it's not it's not cheap cheap, but it yeah. was. Relatively no, cheap. yeah, yeah. But I really right. looked into one that had a deep throat, so I could make sure I wasn't buying something that would just annoy me straight away by not being able to yeah. do things. But then I see people with their Massive bandsaws, and I think <laughs> oh, I'm envious. <laughs> so, big joiners, I get I get jealous over. <laughs> hey, so we've talked before about what are like good tools for a beginner to first buy in their workshop. What what do you think 
is a good way to to start off. I mean, you've talked about your planar fitness a lot. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> So I mean, whenever a conversation about that comes up, always in the chat, there's people wanting one. Yeah, yeah. Because they're so useful. I'd, I'd probably say bandsaw, though, to be fair. Um, you know, because I've seen people having to go cutting out necks and bodies with a jigsaw, which is doable, but obviously the blade likes to wander. Mm. So you can end up cutting on an angle, you know, without knowing, and, you, and your blade will drift underneath. But, yeah, I'd... I'd I'd say a bandsaw because even what was mine? Mine was obviously it's only a small bench top one, but it was still big enough to cut uh, every, well, everything I needed really. But body cut a body out fine. Um, I just think yeah, probably probably the most useful thing really. Um, yeah, I think that to... was one of the first things I got that, and I bought a pillar drill as well. Um, yeah, which I did, don't use at what well, I use quite a lot now, but I didn't really use as much to start with. I just thought it would help improve the quality of what I was doing by making sure uh, things were absolutely dead straight whenever I was yeah, doing yeah. perpendicular. Yeah, the pillar drills are great. The only problem I find is that a lot of the um bridge post studs too far away for the reach of the pillar drill that I've got. <laughs> So one of the most important holes that you want to get perfectly perpendicular, you can't reach it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I'm pretty good at drilling by hand. Um, <laughs> but I have I have been looking out for a, a, a radial one. Um, yeah, I just haven't got the pockets for it yet. So I've got a radial one, and it's okay. But what I notice is sometimes it sort of tilts a bit. So yeah, every time yeah. I use it, I have to use my set square, make sure it's all perfect. Yes. And uh, sometimes I forget, and then I notice it's not quite because i want but maybe that's just again down to not buying a really expensive one i don't know um, or, or my inability to lock it properly <laughs> human error <laughs> um error. so I was, I was looking on your instagram your guitars seem to be very varied in the sort of designs you do and, and when i saw them as well i i noticed we, we were talking about finishing when i saw them at the show you some of them yeah. are not some of them were poly yeah is, is there a reason you just jump around so much is it is it for making yeah. people or something else? yeah just because my head's a bit messed up that's all i get random ideas at random times and then just follow one through <laughs> just whatever so right now a lot <clears throat> a lot of it is yeah um uh sort of custom orders whatever they like and just I never really say no. If someone says, oh, can you do this? Yeah, I'll have a go. Even if I've not done it before, I can't see why not. I've been, um, been doing um, LED side dots in a fretboard today, this morning using fiber optic wire, you know, fiber and cable, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I've been put, setting them in um, because someone asked me, uh, making a neck for a guy, and he asked me about doing it because I've done fret dots on the front with LEDs. And uh, then somebody asked me about the size. So I was like, yeah, can't see why not. So I had a little look around. Um, and, and same with the finishing, really. I've done crackle because someone asked me, can you do crackle? Well, yeah. The way I look at most things is if if it's been done, why can't I do it? it, it you know what I mean? If, there's, yeah, there's a crackle in the middle, yeah. I'll just say if, 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 if people have seen it somewhere else, and someone's already done it. Why? There's no reason I can't do it. That's the way I look at it. And just say, yeah, maybe it's overconfidence on my part. I don't know, but I've never really had an issue. That one's um, that explorer there. Actually, there's pearl uh, in the in the lacquer, so it's, it's purple on the back. And then I did a coat of pearl over the top before I put the clear coat on, and and you get a nice um, sort of metallic shimmer effect on it uh, and that was nitro uh, and then i'll come back to the halo one in a minute because that's right up my street <laughs> that's Ooh, uh, little, little film sorry i wasn't expecting that i thought it's gonna be a no, I haven't. oh yeah it's uh yeah greg who's playing it um so that was the first seven string and the first multi-scale so i decided to 
combine them both and do a seven string multiscale, as you do. That's actually poly on the body as well. So fin finishing's been a, a big thing for me, the sort of spraying. Um, I can't where, remember where, why. Where do you do your spraying then? Have you got a spray booth or? I, I have now. I used to do it in a, in a polythene tent that I made in my shed. Literally made a, a two by one frame that was um, 1200 by 600. So uh, what's that? Four foot by two foot footprint <laughs> uh, and just tall enough for me to stand up in and hang a guitar uh, and it was just a two by one frame wrapped in a polythene sheet just to try and keep some dust off and then I had a, a fan blowing in so it's positive vent just with a flapper door so that in theory any dust and overspray got blown out um but I just I just felt like um it was just another process if I could do that it takes um uh how is it? it it's one less thing that i'd need to rely on somebody else for right if that makes sense and, so, and if somebody then came to me and said can you do a crackle finish guitar i was like yeah i can and then i don't have to sort of uh, send that away to get done I, I can do it all in house and it's just i don't know i just find it easier being able to do it all mm. that makes sense looks uh, awesome <clears throat> I was going to say, Scott, I know you were just trying out a new finish as well, the UV Cure stuff. Yeah. You weren't, weren't a fan of it. <coughs> I think it would be fine if uh, if it's something that you're not, you know, worried about sanding through on occasion. Yeah. That was a problem I ran into. It, anything... Mm, it just didn't self-level very well, so you would have to put a lot of sanding into into getting it, you know, nice and flat. And at least, you know, in early uh, coats, it, it was easy to sand through. And when you when you've dyed something, uh, it doesn't take much of a sand through to just absolutely ruin it. So, so I, I haven't given up on it. It'll be it'll be fine for you know natural for natural wood, you know, right. top or whatever, but. Yeah, with the dye, it was just trouble. Uh -huh. that's, uh, that's that's good to know actually, because I looked at that solar res stuff very briefly. I uh, do. <clears throat> All right, well, when I when I first looked into it, uh, and I, I forget the details of what I actually got, but the finish finish uh, was polyester, but they suggested using their. Um, I think it was uh, labeled a sanding sealer, um, so that the polyester would actually, you know, bond to. Uh, it, it mentioned the possible problems with just bare wood or whatever. Um, and the sanding sealer, I, I do like. I, I, I do. It, it sands real easy. Um, but you know, just like the the polyester, it you know it cures in the sun and in, in less than ten minutes, yeah. which was pretty awesome. So. I still, I, I will use that quite a bit, um, but the polyester, it's, man, that shit is tough. It, it really is bulletproof. Um, so I, I still think it'll be great in some situations, just not with the dye. Dye was trouble. <laughs> We've all been there. That's, <laughs> that, that's the, the good thing about nitro, isn't it? Just touch it in nice and, oh, yeah, that easy. And once you've got it level sanded, if you go through, you just touch that bit in and then just polish that bit and, and yeah. the jobs are good. And yeah. I do like it for that. But I, I'm I'm into PU at the minute, which is, which is great because, you know, it's cured in three days. So you can buff it up. You don't have to wait weeks and weeks like nitro. And you're applying that with just, a, air, a spray gun? Yeah, yeah. I've just, um, I just put a, a video on last night, actually, of me spraying uh, a double neck SG. Oh, that's, that's in poly. Uh, set a camera up in the corner of spray booth watching you know filming doing it um but yeah proper you know, compressor got an air fed mask for the for the poly um yeah yeah it's it, it's it's you know, well it's taking it's taking me a while because it's all self-taught and it's it's one of the hardest things because everything everything pretty much everything i've ever done has been self-taught but spraying is one of the hardest things to teach yourself because you don't know it's not obvious where you're going wrong you just get a crap result and you're just like why then you've got to figure out why you've got that 
obviously unless you've got someone there teaching you showing you and he can tell you why it's happened but when you teach yourself you're just like it doesn't make sense if you know what i mean why has yeah. it happened i think that's probably one of the reasons i i my i don't have a gun i don't have a booth it's it's the one upgrade i need to move to but with without having any exposure to it i don't know what to do i don't know what to get yeah. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to clean it and maintain it. The, you know, yeah, that's um, really interesting because there's. I don't see many guitar videos about that. Well, we see yeah, no. guitar. We keep saying we see lots of people doing fret leveling, blah blah blah. Yeah, something different. Uh, most of my builds, you never see the finish, you know, because it's it's hanging in the yard with a rattle can, and that's just embarrassing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so many people doing it though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah well i mean i don't i don't think there's anything wrong with it you know like this last one wound up being a, a 2k lacquer but you know it, it's a rattle can i think you just wind up with more orange peel and you know have more leveling to do honestly but i don't know that because i don't know what kind of material you know uh people with a better setup will, will spray i don't know if it's better quality if it you know has more durability um this last one, since it's a commission for uh, for a teenager, you know, I my thought was durability is you know number one. Yeah. This, this needs to be encased in Teflon, you know. But uh, yeah, finish, um, finish is definitely well, my week. Well, I was going to say you probably probably overthinking it a little bit. I've seen people get great results with a rattle can. I think. The advantage of spraying is um, cost, first and foremost. That too. People yeah. over here sell out uh, um, 400 mil rattle can of nitro. And I, I don't know what the sort of imperial, what a US equivalent would be, but I don't know. It's not quite a pint, if you know what I mean. Uh, and they're, what are they like, 15 quid? F yeah, 15 to 20. For a can of that. Yeah, where I can get five liters of nitro for about 25, 30 quid. You see, I had the opposite. I used to use a, uh, an air gun, a compressor with a big air gun. I didn't have a great space to do it in, though, but I used to use it. And at the time when I was doing it, I could only buy the finishes I wanted in big quantities. And it just yeah. kept getting wasted. So I moved to spray cans because I had a smaller space. It was easier to use and I wasn't wasting as much paint. But now I'm definitely going to move back. I've got to set something up, though, to using the gun because I'm just constantly buying cans and I'm getting yeah. through so much because I've got more work on, which is great. Yeah. So I've got to go more efficient cost wise and better. Finish. Yeah. yeah. So what I do, I, I tint. I've bought a range of tints. Oh, and I tint yeah. a lot of my own. So got clear, clear finishes, mm -hmm. clear base coats, and just tint to, to the colour that I need. Which... I've also noticed so many places now sell it in smaller quantities. When I did it, like, I think it was just over 10 years ago, I could only buy big quantities. It might have been that I was looking in the wrong places, but I was, I was buying massive tins. Uh, ridiculous. If you find, I know there's a, there's a place not too far from me that I've recently discovered. Yeah, I've not actually been there yet, but you can get colours mixed, and right. I think you can get down to like a a, a litre. That's of, amazing. Yeah, paint. Yeah, which isn't as bad as five litres, obviously, but you know it's probably still works out a little cheaper to do it that way if you set up for it. But then obviously you got the expense of setting all the gear, the equipment up as well. Yeah. Um, you know, compressors and and gun and everything. I dread to think how much I spent. The, the I bought a new compressor when I got the new workshop set up. Um, I bought a new compressor solely for running an air fed mask for spray, spraying the two K. Um, I, I think that was the best part of five hundred quid. Wow, yeah, just for the compressor. So I don't really dread to think what I've actually spent on the full setup. Like, but I do have a compressor. Yeah, so uh, i do have a compressor i've got a relatively small one and then i've got a big one that i inherited from dad um but you know it was always around for you know nail guns and, and things like that i do have the compressor i just <laughs> all the pieces i need 
Well, I, I was fortunate enough uh, when I got this this new workshop came with um, an inter like a, you know an internal wall as well. The guy had it as a, a, a toilet and a kitchen on the end, so I was like, yeah, that's great because then that can be my spray booth, <laughs> which was was, was the toilet. Uh, and then the kitchen area was put a bench in for setups and the relatively clean stuff, so it keeps the dust away. So it's, it's, it's worked out great then. Like as soon as I saw it, I walked in. I was like, oh yes, here we go. So then I was planning out the the whole spray booth then. Ever since that. See, I would have uh, seen that and thought, uh, I live here now. Yeah, <laughs> that was, I mean, that was the second thought. My first thought was a spray booth. My second thought was moving out. I was like, oh, you'd have know, to take spray dust mask, but you know. <laughs> But yeah, so, but it, but it's, <clears throat> I think it's good because then it, it sort of opens up other stuff. So there's, um, I've done a purple metal flake for finish for a guy. Um, you just, I don't know, just a bit more variation of, um, nothing's impossible sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I guess if you're mixing it yourself like that, I'm just trying to find your purple metal flake to share. Um, there um, it is. Early in the year somewhere. Yeah, that's it. Wow. And it, again, is that one you've mixed yourself then? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> all that is you can get the metal flake in the colour you want uh, and just drop it in your clear coat or your base coat. Yeah, I, nice. I use the clear coat, but you can use it in base coat and then clear over it. But yeah. Awesome. The, next, time, next time I'll do it in the base coat. Because you've got to put more product on to to sort of level it out before you can sand it. Then that's the downside. Because if you sand through, you just end up with silver bits where it takes the colour off. So I, I saw a really yeah. great finish where they put it in the base coat, but not much flake, and then they put clear on with some in, and then more clear on. And as the layers had built up, it, it kind of because it was so thick, it looked quite three dimensional the way they done. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. That's cool. I've seen them do it with different size flake as well. Oh, that's a cool idea, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, that's pretty cool, that. Then you can start with a bigger one, and then use a thinner one, which will sort of fill in some of the gaps, as it were, and then you get, you know, different effects again. Well, yeah. Earlier on, um, Music Therapy Laz said in the chat, have any of us used enamel to, to paint guitar? Is that it's not something I've used? No, no not for me. No, because I, I, I just kind of went straightforward and a bit looking around like what are people spraying with i mean in theory you could use anything it's, it's just wood in it there's nothing really guitar about it if you know what i mean just any finish you could even use automotive things um so i just i just well I've got an account with um one of the suppliers that the furniture place where i used to work they used so I suppose really that was only that was the only place I was exposed to, uh, you know, on a sort of trade basis. So that's the name that stuck in my mind from that. So I just went and got an account with them, and they they only do wood finishes, but they do the full range. You know, they got you know nitro and then polyester, polyurethane, acrylic stuff, acid mm. cap, all that stuff. They do everything, but. Um, yeah, I just I just spoke to their rep once, once I got uh, the account set up. The rep came round and I just, just basically took his recommendation. I think that's where I went wrong because I was trying to buy the the finishes I was using in bulk from furniture suppliers, and yeah. I think if you go for certain types of finishes from automobile supply uh, automotive companies, they do smaller supplies of it. I that's what I'm yeah. recently. Yeah, I think generally that's it. Yeah, if you're a, a, a certain colour or, or whatnot, then you can get smaller quantities, yeah, on the sort of automotive side. That seems yeah. counterintuitive. Yeah. I think I maybe like I've definitely getting was getting five litre cans before. I'm not getting through that it's a lot of guitars. It's it is a lot. Considering I think I mean I still over it when I when I'm mixing up the two K I still over mix, but I, I know roughly um it's about a hundred to hundred and fifty mils will do three coats of a full guitar, including the neck, roughly. And I and I still always end up wasting some, but I, I'd rather 
have some to waste and having to like panic. In fact, I had to do that with, with that SG the other day. Um, didn't you know? So sort of didn't um, allow for the fact that it's, there's an extra neck and another half a body stuck on the side, mixed up the same amount, and then got like I did two coats and I looked. I was like, I'm not getting a third coat out of that. So I had to bin the mix, clean everything down, and then make a new mix. But um, obviously, you've got a small window of time to get your poly coats on top. Otherwise, they don't sort of uh, bond into the same. If if it go, if it goes if it cures too far between coats. It has nothing for the next one to bond to, so not like nitro where it keeps um, mm. sort of re-wetting it and, and building up. So you've got a you've got a small window. You've got to give enough time for it to to um, gas off, so you don't get solvent pot. But then you've got to be quick enough that it's still tacky, so the next coat bonds to what you've already sprayed. So yeah, I, I realised after the second coat, I wasn't getting a third coat out. So to bin the mix, clean everything down, and make a new mix all within about ten minutes. That's too complicated. <laughs> It is, it is it is chemistry is dumb <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that would have been hard it's, to discover it is, it is it is tricky but you know it's but that's why if you get a nitro job it makes a nice change because then you're like oh, you can be a lot more relaxed about it you can give it three hours between coats if needs be and it'll just yeah. go back on straight over the top yeah um but you know it's oh that sounds tricky when yeah. I was at college, I studied art, and my tutor, who was a sculptor, his daughter was a ceramicist, and he used to say that they used the same materials a lot of the time, him and his daughter, and the difference was, as a ceramicist, she knew the exact amount she had to measure out to get everything how she wanted it, and he just sort of did it all by eye, and sort of yeah, went in, and that's my, definitely my approach, is doing things by eye, so anything that involves precision, uh, I find a little bit, well, I mean, obviously, guitar making involves precision. But I mean, the, the mixing side of it all, you yeah. get a little bit. Um, exactly. I, know I know what you mean. Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I still do now. I, I get this weird, you know, like you know, like when, when you're a kid and you and you got to do like I don't know, like a, a school play or whatever, and you get that sort of butterfly feeling in your stomach. I sometimes still even get that when I spray poly now, because <laughs> I just think because everything's got to be the mix has got to be bang on 50 50 you know too much or too little hardener and, and it can be game over and and then you just always worry like oh something goes wrong you know you touch it or you get a fly in it or anything like that and you know it's just uh, so so you can't touch it up afterwards you know if anything happens you've got to let it cure sand it back and respray it whereas i'm a lot more nonchalant with nitro because you just know if something happens you just spray it in afterwards you know yeah. it, it is what it is Bill said, has anyone seen these new paints that are more like a wrap? I'm not really sure what that is. Um, mm. So I haven't. I did try I um, hydro dipping, is in the style where you have uh, a print that you put on the top of the water and it's and you slightly, you, you activate it so it starts to dissolve and then you put yeah, your guitar yeah. in and it adheres to that. And I first time I did it, it had amazing results. Well, this is brilliant. And then I have every time i did it afterwards i just couldn't get it right and it just had little tears or crinkles in it and yeah, yeah it was a bit bit much i felt uncomfortable using it. it wasn't quite my thing i think yeah i just i don't like the idea of water on wood <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's why i'm not bothered. loads of people have sent it to me i was like mm, i don't fancy dipping a guitar in water I, and i know it's only like in and out but it but just still. doesn't nick in my head. <laughs> I mean, I was doing it on something that had been fully painted first, so you've got a little bit of protection from the paint. But yeah. That's what I mean, because, you know, I, I know that it, it'd have some sort of base coat or whatever on first, but I still can't get my head around, you know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, there are certain places that are, should still be raw, like like the neck pocket, and uh, yeah, that's true. if there's any place that needs to be precision, yeah. Oh, you know me and precision, I've already mentioned that. Um, <laughs> this is right up my street, Mark. Wow. <laughs> Very good. Again, was that was that something of your own, or was that a co co uh, like sorry, was it of your own design? Was that a commission type thing? No, no, it was just yeah. So there is, um, I've, there was, um, I can't remember the, the the guys that did it, but someone made an energy sword guitar. Um, 
and I've, I, I've actually spoke to the guy he messaged me when when i shared this and it sort of went viral and he messaged me and i was chatting to him for a bit and um so my mate saw the post on facebook of the energy sword and then tagged me in it i was like oh yeah that's well cool because so yeah, it's a guy i've been mates with since school and obviously halo was our sort of era and um we still play it now me and him get together with a bottle of jack and play halo all night um, I remember when he got his when he got his new Xbox and he downloaded it. We we did a co-op on the original Halo and completed it in one night. <laughs> wow. That's not to say we did it fast. That's just to say how long we stayed up playing Halo yeah. for. <laughs> um, so yeah, we were just talking. And I was like, Gravity Hammer would make a cool guitar, wouldn't it? Because like the hammer head be the body and then the shaft would be the neck. I was like, yeah, that's a cool idea. So that's how it came about, basically. I was like, yeah, I'll give it a go. Uh, and yeah, that was the result. <laughs> awesome. So, got a load of pictures of, of a grab hammer off Google and uh, made a little, um, you know, drawing, laid it on. That's cool. Yeah, yeah that, that's <laughs> definitely the sort of thing I'm keen to do. Those sort of weird sci fi looking things. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think there is. Um, there's probably a market for it if you, if you can tap into it. I've had people message me about Tron as well. You know, doing something like a, a Tron style guitar. Um, it's n nothing's ever come of it, obviously, but you know, this guy said he's got some ideas. I was like, well, come around whenever we can discuss it and whatnot. You know, I like stuff like that. I like lights as well. So, yeah, lights are a big annoyance of mine at the moment. I am. Um... <laughs> I'm trying to find the right thing to put on guitars that don't doesn't look like lots of LEDs. So I've gone for highly packed cob LED strips that I've got in my workshop. I was just trying before I came up. And even though they're highly packed with diffusers, they you can still see the individual light. The um, and I tried EL wire, but that interferes with humbuckers. It just has a sort of fuzz, uh, sorry, right. uh, a, a sort of static noise that comes through. Yeah, yeah. But you were trying, you say you're trying fiber optics. Yeah, yeah. I don't know a huge amount, but I believe that the, you can get a side glow fiber optic as well. Yeah, but from what I gathered, you needed a big thing at the end of the fiber optic to light it. Yeah, you do. So uh, on this, it's just for the side dots that I'm doing, and I think it's about a mil, the, the, the fiber optics I'm using. So they end up with 12. It's a 24 fret guitar, so I've got 12. Uh, strands which should when you bundle it up into a circle and I'll, I'll sleeve it with some um shrink wrap so it'll hold it together and then you know it should uh, sort of darken it as well but it should i'm hoping line up with about a five or a six mil led should be the same right. diameter in theory Ooh, that's interesting yeah and then getting even should get an even so my plan is obviously sleeve sleeve them onto the led um with heat shrink tube to try and keep all the light directed onto the end of fiber optics that's my plan as you can tell i'm just saying this to try and sound like i know what i'm on about yeah i because i've not used fiber optics. i wonder how powerful the led has to be to not very let me tell you really okay. <laughs> I've, been yeah, I've been testing them with the led on my phone you know the torch yeah and it's yeah it gets very bright and in fact some of them it's got a big window facing a bench and some of them if you catch them in the right angle just daylight and you can see a big difference oh right i'm gonna give that give that a go then give up on these leds and give that a go thanks for that yeah. no, no, i've just got to try and work out if i can do it for the front of the fretboard i was using micro leds in the inside dots recently because they're so tiny and they're super bright and i think that's yeah. what i'm going to use going forward um yeah well, the advantage up. of fiber optics, which, and this is something that I've fallen foul of a couple of times now, um, if you, if if an LED dies, um, you haven't got to rip it apart. So if if you set, set LEDs, oh, yes, okay, that makes sense. Dies, whatever, you got to take your fretboard off to change the LED or whatnot. But with fiber optics, the LED is always going to be in the control cavity, so it's just a case of changing a bulb somewhere accessible and i've had that the um the 
that purple explorer that has leds up the fretboard and one of them has died on the 12th which is really annoying um and the, that halo one as well the gravity hammer to be that that has leds and there's one of them i think it's around 19. you set this truss rod in a certain position and it goes off but then if you're slacking it off a touch it comes back on yeah. so obviously <laughs> the perfect position that i wanted it in for like the best relief turned it off <laughs> wow so but yeah anyway and that, that that's the problem with leds you know you, you've got to rip the fretboard off to get to it if you have a problem with one of them whereas the fiber optics very clever i i yeah. feel like I, or I hope that these chats we all ha we have are really helpful for people watching and give people ideas and things and that has definitely changed what i'm doing because I've, I've spent spent quite a long time now trying out all these led strips to get what i want and i think that's going to be my way forward as my next step yeah, anyway yeah. to try so thanks for that cool yeah I've, I've taken some pictures i'm going to do um i might do a little write-up online I've, I've started trying to do a few write-ups on the fretboard.co.uk but i've never really been you know when you go on forums and they always have that guy who just like everyone knows and seems to know everything and everybody watches all these build you know they read all these build threads and he gets thousands I've never been that guy and i've tried to do it and i don't know it's like it's never seemed like pop food if you know what i mean but you know just keep doing it someone might read it <laughs> but I'll, I'll do that i did it i put a um a marshall ms2 um on board a guitar and i did a write-up of that with loads of pictures and stuff and that went down quite well sounds a bag of shit, but you know it's a cool idea <laughs> <laughs> the feedback's horrendous <laughs> um well you know it, it was a fun little concept idea that we did um so yeah keep doing these things so yeah i'm gonna i'll i'll like i said taking the pictures i'll just do a little layer uh, little write-up on how i've done it with some pictures of of how i've laid the uh, fiber optics and stuff like that so uh yeah keep an eye out have a look at that oh that'd be cool um yeah but bill's just said um that these uh podcasts chats whatever live streams give him lots of ideas he hates us for all of them <laughs> <laughs> i guess i guess it means I, I i i have this difficulty definitely where whenever i have a new idea i want to start it and that means i don't finish the one that i was just working right. on <laughs> or i yeah, buy yeah. it to start it and then never get it started it's, it's yeah hard to, hard to focus sometimes yeah no it's the same I, i'm the same a lot of what you said right at the start about all these very finishes and where the ideas come from exactly the same thing you just you'll see something whatever i don't know walking down the street or something daft and just like that'd be cool in a guitar and then like you say you've already got four on the go that are unfinished that were cool ideas that you saw somewhere and then you think oh well start another one yeah yeah you know I mean? yeah i have a tendency to like you know collect techniques you, you want to try something that okay this works that'll be cool on a guitar well and uh, just wind up with this big collection of techniques on you know a bunch of unfinished stuff because you keep thinking i'm building this repertoire of uh, you know things that will go into the the some amazing project and that project never comes to fruition yeah 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 standard i've got um talking talking about finishing again i've still got uh, a bag of chameleon um flip paint uh tin so like purple green flip paint i still got that that i've had for about four years maybe three years that i was going to do a, a purple green flip guitar and i'm still not getting around to that that's all cool. <laughs> so yeah so it goes so what i would like to quickly ask people in the chat so people watching this like in the future you could also put this in the comments below but in the live chat it'd be great to know if any of you have actually been to a guitar show uh, and if not is it just because they're so far away like scott was saying earlier and mark it sounds like you've been to quite a few then uh yeah a, a very veritable season pro <laughs> yeah and I, I um when did i do the first one i think the first one i did was towards the end of 2021 when all the restrictions were lifted um 
and then did quite a few last year and a few this year. Um, but yeah, I'm just a, a grumpy, cynical bastard though, so. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't enjoy a lot of them, let's be honest. <laughs> I, I liked what you said to me before. It's, it's hard to know if they're successful or not until six months down the line when you find out someone has wants to buy something because they saw it six months yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. That's it. it, it the, uh, there was a point where I was sort of like a 50-50 success rate of actually selling on the day. And I never... I never go with that sort of mentality. Oh, I'm going to sell something today. You know, it's it's a cliche, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's just about getting your name out there. You know, what I mean, speak to people because not everyone's going to like what you do. Not everyone's going to like you. People buy from people, don't they? And if, yes. if they don't like you and they don't speak to you, and they don't have that repertoire, then they just forget about you and move on. So, no <laughs> shows on the moon. Um, yeah. So. And I think that's the funny thing because mine are so um, sort of varied and um, unique, I suppose. There's not a not a lot of people that attend shows that are interested in what I have to offer, basically. If I had a table full of tobacco burst straps and Les Pauls, then you know I'd be inundated and I'd be selling them left, right, and centre. But nah, that, that ain't for me. That, that's just boring and, and typical, like. So I want to do something. I want to do crazy crackles and, and metal flakes. Yeah. I've, said it, I've said it a million times. Guitar people are stupid. Yeah. So many. It seems like the vast majority of people, if it's, if it's not a Tele, a Strat, or a Les Paul, they, 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 it's not a guitar in their mind somehow. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. No. I know, I'm doing all right. It's one of the reasons I, feel like I we should have a compilation, Scott, of how many times you said that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's I true. Agree. Be if, I, if, if I if if I was rich enough, I think I'd probably buy all the black strats, tobacco strats, anything else. Well, I don't know. Me, yeah, uh, Les Pauls as well. Fuck it, I'd buy them all and just burn them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Just no. It, just it was buy a company and you know change it change everything yeah you get loads of views yeah, yeah. Burn them all in a massive pyre on youtube yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well i mean it's a bit it's a bit of a blink of view from a, a business point of view though because if i did all that stuff i'd probably sell more but you know i want to have fun i've never made the same guitar twice and i never will because i want to have fun and do something different every time you know what i mean right. and, and i'm kind of sort of funneling into a, a, a metal market you know as it were customers but they're the ones that have got more interesting ideas like they want to make their own shapes and do wild finishes and let's have seven or eight strings yeah yeah let's do it yeah you know what i mean there's me I, I don't want to do boring junk that everybody else has already done i don't yeah i don't want to make copies i want i want to try new things and you know have fun but I've never gone at this, you know, with the expectation of making money either. It's 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 a uh, it's fun for me. it's my you know therapy and my fun. It's it's just a hobby, and I wanted to want to keep it that way. Yeah, yeah, I'm not I'm not making money. Don't get me wrong. I, I do it as a full time job, and I'm just about paying the mortgage. But I'm not making money. Right. I'm having fun, so fuck it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yep, it's exactly. great you're doing it as a full time though. I I definitely um so I moved from a job that was in the art charity sector that never made much money to a guitar job which also doesn't make much money and I'm <laughs> not yeah, really sure it's viable, but <laughs> yeah, you want to do what you want to do, and you're right. Well, that guitar show definitely showed me that people want tellers and strats. It was interesting because you had uh, the floor we were on was a lot of boutique builders mm -hmm. uh, and then the floor below had a lot of more like shops selling things but there's definitely um people go to what they like and they know and feel comfortable yeah. with and I it was what just, I like and I like what I know yeah it's just interesting when you walk around the boutique things how unique and different everyone is um yeah. but then you still get some that do the the boutique telly shape or the, whatever but it was it's just I, I think people are missing out on so much 
because it's not a big name. Yeah, yeah, that's it. See, I want to do. I want to get my hands on some decent uh, tele electronics and then build something that looks fucking nothing like a tele and call it my tele. <laughs> yeah. And prove that it's the electronics that give it the iconic sound and not that stupid slab of shit with a neck bolted to it. <laughs> I hate yeah. Fender just for yeah. the construction method. It's just uh, the flat slab of crap, you know, and bolt on. It's just. I understand why they did it from a manufacturing standpoint. It's, you know, relatively cheap to make and, you yeah. know, pump units out the door. I get it. But, um, I don't think it makes the, you know the best the best guitar. No. no. Also, be really it. Odd. would it be really odd if the first electric guitar that was mass produced happened to be the best design for an electric guitar, and it couldn't evolve better than that? A lot I'd of say ask that. Ask eighty percent of guitarist population. They'll say yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they'll, they'll say strap. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'll just say, move on. <laughs> Find it, someone else. It did hit some, you know, some some key design aspects that are important. And I've talked about this on the video before, you know, with a longer, uh, you know, top horn, you you, uh, you have a better balance and less neck dive, you know, the belly carves. Some of those things are, you know, important features. But the perfect design, I don't know. No. Yeah. yeah, but I think we have to yeah. realize that most of the world like to be like most of the world. They yeah. want to have what other people have got. Yeah, yeah. Which, is, which is strange. I've always liked to be different. So you'd think musicians, performers particularly, would want that, wouldn't you? Bassists seem to be a lot more open to to variation and, and weirdness, and I don't, I don't get that. I don't understand it, six string dipshits that you know think you have to have the same thing that somebody you know was playing seven you know in the 70s yeah <laughs> yeah vintage guitars fuck you know they're not good because they're good it's all they had at the time they had nothing better that's why <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter that jimmy page you know played it it's that's that's <laughs> he'd be playing something different if you know he was yeah, coming up yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's the best they had at the time, and it's shit by com today's comparison. So, <laughs> I can't remember anyway. exactly, but I think, I think this is right. When before Kurt Cobain sort of started playing the jazz stang, the Mustangs, and things like that, yeah. they were really cheap because people didn't want them. Either they were cheap because people didn't want them, or they were budget guitars. But then Ooh, suddenly, yeah. they became the guitar that famous people were playing, and their prices all went up. Yeah. And they're the same <laughs> guitar. Mad in it, mad in it. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I mean, anyway. I guess it, it's kind of the same thing with the, uh, you know, boutique builders. Uh, they're uh, the ones that are highly successful. You know, somebody famous, you know, started playing one, and everybody was like, "Ooh, what's that?" You know. Yeah, yeah that's it. Isn't it? Like uh, Iverson, Richard Fortis, played one of his recently at Glastonbury, didn't he? I, I I just seen some thing in the chat. We're not like dissing people that build other guitars. <laughs> like yeah, no. say, don't don't diss us if we're building this. But um I, I I what I mean is when people are walking around a show, they just sort of focus in on what they know. But yeah. they can see that anywhere. They can see that at a guitar shop. And a lot of the interesting things, and sometimes the interesting thing is the choice of wood. Or the way it's finished is something you don't get to see every day and it always surprised me that people weren't playing them as much at the show i think yeah yeah I, I've, <clears throat> I've run into this before where people got booty hurt at me when you know i'm talking about my personal preference of you know body shapes and stuff and i i don't begrudge anybody for actually building that if that's what you like have fun i don't care and i don't think any less of people who actually like tellies it's just me personally, I don't like it for this reason, and that doesn't mean anything about you know how I feel about other people's opinion. I don't play like my opinions, you know, brilliant. Uh, I, I got some goofy. I'm so picky about bodies, and I it, I kind of don't understand why. 
and it kind of bothers me sometimes, but um, I'm super picky about it. And that doesn't mean I, you know, I think my opinion's gold. It just, that's just how I feel. Yeah. I just can't stand, I, can, I just can't stand strats. I'm not afraid to tell everybody. <laughs> everybody I, that knows me knows I hate them, so, you know. But, you know big route out of the out of the front and a pick guard i've just never been real impressed with with that <clears throat> in some instances that pick guard can you know accentuate and look kind of cool but for the most part uh but you know most of my builds have been wood inspired and you know it, i you, you spent a lot of money on this you know beautiful exotic thing for a top and i don't want it covered with pit guard you know yeah why, why do you want to cover it in mother of bog seat yeah <laughs> i mean yeah. i i grew up as a strap person i love them but now someone that has to repair and do things to them i i do find it annoying having that big pit guard on it <laughs> um I mean, it's yeah. it's kind of a cool design that you can just pop that whole thing off and you know put a whole new one on, but but it's just boring. Anyway, <laughs> we can go on about this for ages. One thing I like, I'm just going to veer us towards the great guitar build off. One thing I yeah. like about the great guitar build off is people definitely seem to try interesting things out with it. Um, yeah. even even if they're doing something that's more traditional, they they always take a different stance on it, which I find interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, there you go. Oh, well, uh, uh, yeah, that's what I was say. On that note, I'm going to have to love you and leave you now because oh. I've got a customer due in a few oh. minutes. So exciting. Well, money. <laughs> well, what I'm going to say to everyone is, I'll put I've put a link to Mark's um, YouTube in the description for this. Um, <laughs> I'll put some other links up. I'll do them up and but look him up on Instagram, etc. Give him a follow. <laughs> and thanks yeah. again, Mark. That's great. It's been, no it's worries. Been, it's been fun. And thanks for the fiber time. optic uh, suggestion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I'm, I'm taking pictures and, and stuff. I'll write it up and whatnot, and I'll um, I'll try and remember to send a link when it's cool. done. You can have a thanks. look. Okay, no. Cool. Right. Take care. Catch you in a bit. Okay. Great. So, uh, yeah, there he's gone. Um, on the on the subject of uh, creativity and, and great guitar build off, the first thing that I think of is uh, Mark Gutierrez last year. <laughs> it was it was kind of refreshing. I actually chuckled when I heard him say, uh, "Yeah, this is not ergonomic. It's not comfortable, I, and I don't care. <laughs> yeah. I think it looks cool." <laughs> Yeah. That level of honesty was was uh, I actually laughed, uh, but I, I haven't quite, I haven't watched his final video that he just put up yesterday. I think it was um, of his new. I think it's a final video. It looked it was it was labelled as if it was. Um, I haven't seen it either yet. Yeah. Oh, maybe I just saw a photo of it on Instagram. I'm sure I saw a thumbnail. Anyway, he's going to come on in a couple of weeks' time to chat with us as well. Um, it looks like it will be at a time when Aaron can be here as well. Yeah, I was slightly disappointed I wouldn't be involved, but I will. No, at least well, you're going to be involved as well. <laughs> no, you, Scott, you, you should be there okay. as well. We're doing it at a time where Aaron's going to stay up late. I got you. I got you. So it will be, I think it will probably be the same time we normally do it. Okay. I uh, just got to check with Mark, but I think that's the plan. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Aaron said that he's, because th that will be a start of December. And then he's back. He, he's not working it as much like he, he is. He doesn't mind doing a bit of a late night every now and then. Yeah. Great. Um, That'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah, we have to. I, I think it will carry on into next year, but I wouldn't mind getting some more of the invitationals that have done some interesting things on as well. But what, what's been good is, and I'll, I'll say it's out to anyone watching and anyone live stream. Um, yeah, there's been quite a few people that have, have said, like Mark that we just had, watched a couple of episodes, follow the Instagram page or whatever. I've said they want to come on to join for a chat. So please, if anyone else wants to, let us know. It was always great to have a rotation, of new people coming on all the time. Yeah. It's been fun to meet some of these people that, you know, uh, haven't really had a chance to talk to before, but yeah. uh, seen their work and, you know, it's kind of cool. Yeah, it was weird because Mark had contacted us 
and said he wanted to be on it. And then I saw him at the show and he was like, oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to our chat. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about because I, I didn't have his face. <laughs> I didn't realise who he was until yeah. I, he then walked me over to his stand and I saw the, the name of the, the brand and the guitars. <laughs> yeah, that will be embarrassing. <clears throat> so I, I, I think we should have a quick re reflection on uh, the great guitar build-off. Basically, what, what you miss, Scott, on the Facebook um, mm. group is um, Ben put a video up in which he mentioned various things going ahead with Crimson and he mentioned yep. the great guitar build off. Yep. And I think people started talking about it in the Facebook group without actually watching the video and everyone was panicking that there would never be a great guitar build off again and talking about how much it meant to them, which was, you know, it's really nice to hear people talk about how much building has meant to them, how much being able to talk to other people and be part of a community has really helped them in different ways and how they want to just keep building along with each other. So that was great. But actually what Ben said in the video wasn't very specific, but yeah. it will be more like in the first year where they well, will have some invites and people can build along, but it won't be a competition with a big unmanageable yeah. website. You know, Ben being Ben, it's it would be wise for him not to be specific because it's going to change next week. Mm. But I mean, uh, to, uh, I guess now it, it's not a big deal that it's you know public knowledge that we had a, a call with them some time ago, uh, and they had talked about the fact that they didn't feel like they could do ggbo you know next year at least in the form that it is and we're looking for ideas and, and things and we didn't have a whole lot to provide at the time and of course they never followed up but so we kind of knew that but i i think now we still don't really know much more than we did back then of how it's going to go you know going forward um you know and <clears throat> Plenty of people have been talking online about, you know, um, even if Crimson, Crimson totally, you know, bowed out of it completely, the community is actually there now and, and you know, something will continue. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, Guitar Builders Collective seems like a great, you know, starting point for that. Yeah, uh, so I would definitely recommend anyone that doesn't know what we're talking about. Here's a link. Um, but yeah, the Guitar Builders Collective is. On the forum, there's lots of areas you can talk about with different things to do with building. You can ask each other questions, share photos. And then Corey from Saul Good runs the Instagram page, which is mainly um, sharing of people that are part of the collective so you can see their work, know who they are, and go and follow their pages. And obviously, we're doing this chat regularly. I, I feel like the community that built up because of the great guitar build-off existed because crimson run the competition but yeah. wasn't really managed by crimson you know it's just become a thing so they crimson, don't have to be fully involved with yeah. doing a big competition to keep a community alive crimson was the was a big hub for it um and in the event i really think the the big key thing about the event was that it was an event and there was a you know a finish date and so everybody was working at the same time watching each other at the same time and i think that was the key thing that just made this happen uh the community i mean um i don't know i've had a lot of, of ideas throughout the the years you know but uh i don't know i think <clears throat> i think a lot of people, I don't, I'm not even exactly sure how to articulate this correctly, but um, Ben has been, you know, such a, a an influence in most of our, you know, building because, um, you know, like when I started off like eight years ago, there weren't many people on YouTube doing stuff and, and Ben was it. I mean, you know, and I, so I think a lot of people, he's kind of a rock star too. And, you know, so you remember, uh, when the live stream was was every week last year, uh, it, it almost looked like people were just doing their best to try to get him to say their name on camera because it was, oh, my God, Ben said my name, you know. Uh, 
I don't know if it will have quite as much excitement and allure without, you know, that piece of it, you know? Yeah, I think that's a big part. But again, like, um, it, it, it's a big part of it, but he doesn't really do anything with it at the moment. And mm -hmm. even last year, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely changed the last month or so that the great guitar build off Instagram page is doing more sharing, but it's yeah. not Ben that actually does that. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, and, and Crimson don't really mention it very much. I guess they will in December when they're doing the competition and things. But well, I mean, even even like last year when he was doing the the live stream, it seemed like he was really trying to avoid Great Guitar Build Off questions, and he was just annoyed by the whole thing. Mm. Uh, in the last couple of years, they they've had very little involvement, and you know. When he talks about you know they're bleeding money doing it, I'm, I I can't help but think how, I, I, and I don't know what it takes to run the thing, but it doesn't seem like they're doing that much. So I don't I don't know. I spoke to someone that did a course there last year, and he said that when he was doing the course, there were two or three people working on solely working on the Great Guitar Build Off competition. I guess coordinating the invitationals is, is a reasonable amount of work and they used to have to upload all the videos and photos and things like that. So it is quite heavy at that end, but mm. um, I don't know. And one thing Ben said in his video is exactly what you said, Scott, that he really enjoys when he meets people and they say what an impact him and his videos have had on them. Yeah. And that's what is the thing that drives him. So. Yeah. He's not going to be making lots of videos of fret dressing and stuff because you've seen that before. He wants to do yeah. things that allow him to be creative and um, yeah. interact with people, I guess. Yeah. Something like the Great Guitar Build Off, <laughs> <laughs> where you get anyway. to meet the entire community of people that, you know, think you hung the moon. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to get him on here sometime when he's a bit, well, when he's a bit less busy. I don't know if that would ever happen. Mm, that would be fun. But. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do want to mention here as well, and it's in the description for the video, the Jurg's Cup, because with the Great Guitar Build-Off coming to an end, I think a lot of people are going to be focusing on that, and that's hopefully a way to sort of extend the community bit. I know there's a lot of people in the Great Guitar Build-Off page on Facebook that weren't aware of it. So I think once the competition's out of the way, I'm going to at least try and promote yeah. it a bit just to give some people a, a, another way of sharing your builds and to talk about it because one thing that's great instagram's great you see the pictures but one thing that is good about facebook is people can say here's where i'm at with my progress since last week with my build and people yeah. comment on it even if the comment is looking good or great progress or things like that it definitely pushes it through Oh, I see um, Scott from Sweet Tea's just put a comment in about going to shows and how shows are overloaded. But yeah, Scott's on the four, on the great guitar build up. Scott, sorry. Todd is on the, um, <laughs> the forum a lot and uh, on the Facebook page a lot. And yeah, I know he's keen to drive more kind of, uh, comp not necessarily competitions, but builds where people can all build along together and have a focus. Mm. I think that focus is one thing that helps. If everyone's just building, it's great. But having something to share about instead of you just, just like I'm a member of a lot of Facebook pages and groups where people are builders and they will post up what they're building. But when you know you're all building it for the same purpose, even if what you're building is totally different, yeah. it just gives you a little bit more thing to connect you. Yeah. There's something about that time limit. It's, it just brings everything together and focused. Yeah, absolutely. So, look, while we're here, um, I've got two things to share. I'm going to put one of them in the in the live chat, and you can get a link from my YouTube page. But tomorrow, at the same time as this, we've got the next episode of Luffy's Lunch Break. It's going up, which I'm really proud of. So it's uh, another um, little compilation show, I think, then tomorrow's one's about 35 minutes long 
it's got a number of different builders in it talking about different ways of finishing different tools um ideas for designing and um wiring and and things about how pickups work i'm hoping that with that show going out every couple of weeks with little clips in it it will help inspire a few people to make and build and join a community and and maybe provide stuff as well so if anyone's watching this that is quite keen on making short youtube videos and wants to share one with me let me know i'm putting a few in that people have already made they've already made the videos they've already got them up it's just a way of sort of bringing it together and helping to share what you're doing to other people and also i've put out in the um made a little playlist for uh this the guitar builders collective chat and in it i'll just see if i can get the link for it um it's got the forthcoming episodes as well so i'll put the link for that in the chat too yeah those have been pretty fun so if you haven't been catching those do yeah so like we've got uh oh they're not all up there so we've got um jack from jc guitar company next week and he's going to be talking about using cnc machines and how he uses cnc in his guitars he also makes for other people so guitarists will, or guitar builders will come to him and say for example i want quite an ornate fretboard can you do it for me and he helps them develop the designs and, and then makes them he also what i thought sounded quite interesting is he um built his own cnc machine so he said as a result of building his own cnc machine and teaching himself how to use it he's doing it slightly differently maybe to someone that's been trained on how to use a cnc interesting yeah but i've already had some questions people asked about tolerances and how you set up cnc so if anyone else has got anything they want to ask let me know and we can ask him um so that's next week the week after we've got gordon from Faisal Valkin guitars now i bumped into him was also at the at that guitar show in london mm. and he told me Faisal Valkin and i was like i know that but i didn't know why and it's because i'd only ever seen it written down and never really pronounced it before mm. but he, he i think his builds for the great guitar build off are really interesting um yeah. i'm quite keen to ask him about how he does his builds they're very intricate mm -hmm. And then we've got a um, potentially, I think we, I haven't told you this yet, Scott, but I was just speaking to Curtis from Goff Rider. Um, mm. not, is that, yeah, Goff Rider Creations. Yeah. And he, he's probably going to join us the week after that. Then we've got Mark Guterres. And then um, basically we could at some point talk about a great guitar build off and that's the end of the year done. Wow. Fantastic. And awesome. I love the fact so many people want to talk and share and, be part of the community it's brilliant yeah and I, I like having new people on every week yeah it's good um so it's not just us talking about the same shit over and over yeah and like i said with when we've got mark on it's a, a period where um aaron's more able to stay up to be with us at our time because it's, it's it's quite late with him um excellent yeah yeah Come Neil about the Jurg's Cup again again the link is in the description below but yeah the initial idea was to raise a bit of, of money to go to a good cause in memory of of um Jurgen but you don't have to pay money to be part of it if, if you want to build along yeah yeah I don't know where that came from uh but there was some discussion recently with somebody they had just discovered a little bit about it and thought, you know, that that was a requirement somehow. And I don't know where that came from. I think I have seen a couple online where somebody had done, uh, you know, printed pieces and uh, and pieced together a 3D printed guitar. I think I mentioned one in that when we were talking about our favorite builders, that someone I've been following who's been developing one. It's quite small, but... um. That you can buy the files for to print um, maybe i'll try and get them on and talk to them about a process see if i mm, i keep i need to teach myself how to 3d model so i i've thought all along as soon as i got a 3d printer 
I wanted to be able to model my guitars and if I could do like a tiny print, you know, like, I don't know, like a three inch long little print of the, so if somebody did commission a guitar, then they would get this as kind of a key change with their guitar. That would be awesome. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, so I there know. are, I, I, I'd not use them, but I've recently become aware of them. Um, apps you can get on your phone that allow to 3D scan. So you could 3D mm -hmm. scan your um, guitar yeah. and then do a printout of it. Oh, I love that idea. I don't, uh, yeah. Uh, I've, I just assumed that that was going to be problematic and haven't bothered trying it. But uh, I should, I should look into it. But uh, I, looking at the possibility of someday eventually getting a CNC, uh, gonna have to be able to model to, you know, be able to, to print, I mean, to, to do stuff. So it's a skill I need anyway, you know, with a precise, clean, yeah. you know, model. Uh, so I, I, I just assume that, that trying to scan something would not be quite so, so clean and precise, but but then again, I don't know. It's something I need to teach myself. Yeah, I, I, I definitely got the answer. Mm. Anywho. Great. Thanks Thank again, Scott. Thank you, everyone good. that's in the chat. Um, yeah. And anyone that's watching in the future, let us know in the comments where you're from or who you are. We have about a regular, I think, 150 people watching these. Um, mm. Don't know who they are. Unless it's my mum watching it 150 times. Well, it sounds like about the uh, about the number of people that watch all of my videos. So, oh yeah, that'd be a crossover. I, I hope. Um, don't forget, you can follow us. Follow mm -hmm. Aaron. You can follow Mark, who we just had on. I'll put the links in the description. I keep saying that; it's all there. Yeah. Great. Okay. Let us know if you want anything for next time for about CNC. But otherwise, thank you, everyone, and yep. see you next week. Thanks for showing up. The Guitar Builders Collective is a group of like-minded people from all around the world at different stages of their guitar building journey. You can join us over on our forum to seek advice or share tips on guitar building processes, materials and tools, or just to share your builds. On YouTube, we have a regular podcast of guitar building chat where you can join the live stream or watch back on past episodes. Our Instagram page shares posts of members' builds and links you direct to their accounts. And for those of you on Facebook, We've got a private group that you can join, share and chat along with. The Guitar Builders Collective is a welcome and open space for all, so do pop by and say hi. Just check it's actually gone off. Oh, I... <laughs> oh no, we're still live. I don't know how that happened. <laughs>